Well, we are going to go ahead and get started. It is Friday morning. I hope everybody is doing well behind your screens. Cup of coffee, ready to be in a good conversation. Um, this is a fantastic group, and I know a lot of people have uh, are joining us this morning, and I, I, I think it is going to be well worth all of our time. So welcome to the uh, Life Transformative Education, the LTE Speaker Series. We're going to kick this off with a, with a star uh, who, jo who joined us this year, um, but we've got a number of speakers uh, following up. Those schedules are, are already out uh, in a flyer. Hopefully you've accessed that and kind of know what's coming up, but a year and we're just trying to maintain that momentum and move this initiative forward. Uh, and, and there's just a lot of love for UConn in the space. And we're, we're trying to take advantage of that too in the, in the best of ways. This speaker series is going to get started with um, a, a new member of our community. But, you know, if you talk to him for five minutes, it feels like he, he's been here forever. So I'm just going to take a moment to go through his bio uh, to introduce him to you so you have some idea what's going on. And then we're going to let uh, Dr. Tuit jump in and, and do his thing. So Dr. Franklin Tuit uh, has more than two decades of higher education administration experience. He was named the vice president and chief diversity officer at the University of Connecticut in late July 2020. hit the ground running. If you've seen his calendar, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Dr. Tewitt had been a member of the University of Denver faculty since 2004 and was that school's chief diversity officer from 2015 to 2019 as well. From September 2019 to summer 2020, he was a visiting scholar of the ECHO Center for Diversity Policy at The Hague, Netherlands. Dr. Tewitt was the inaugural, the inaugural visiting scholar of the ECHO Center and delivered lectures, facilitated training, and conducted research in, in the Netherlands and to post-secondary institutions across Europe. In his most recent position at Denver, he was responsible for addressing diversity and equity matters and oversaw the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, which included interdisciplinary research the Institute for the Study of Equality, Inequality, and the DU Latino Center for Community Engagement and Scholarship, a big gig. Um, in 2019, he received the National Association of Chief Diversity Officers in Higher Education, Individual Leadership Award in recognition of outstanding contributions to research, administration, practice, advocacy, and or policy and whose work informs and advances understanding of diversity and inclusive excellence in higher education. Uh, Dr. Tewitt first came to the University of Denver as an assistant professor in the Margridge, um, I'm sorry, Mortgage College the Higher Education Program until leaving the college to become the Associate Provost for Inclusive Excellence. He began his professional career with positions at Wesleyan, Harvard, and UMass Boston. So he's an East Coaster at heart, I would argue. Um, Dr. Tewitt earned his undergraduate degree in human relations from Connecticut College, just down the road in New London, where I am sitting right now, and has both a master's and doctorate from Harvard School of Education and Administration planning and social policy with a concentration in higher ed. So I know we have our mutes on, but if you can let those mutes off for a moment and just give a, a hand to Dr. Tewitt. Welcome this morning. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, put those mutes back on so we can keep that bandwidth. Dr. Tewitt, we're so happy to have you here with us this morning and looking forward to hearing a word from you. So welcome. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, still wondering why you picked the newest kid on the block to kick off this series, but happy to be here and looking forward to sharing some thoughts and, and having uh, a discussion. Uh, let, let's just get to it because I do have some information. Let's see if I can get this to work now.
One second. Here we go. So as you see, my title here is Realizing a Transformative Education in Challenging Times, Implications for Making Excellence Inclusive at UConn. And let me just give you a heads up on the talk. What I'm, what I'm trying to argue is that a life transformative education is really about inclusive education. And so hopefully I'll be able to make that case to you. So how I'm gonna try to do that is to first take a look at student protests that's been happening around the globe and extrapolate a little bit about what I think it means for our understanding of the need for a life transformative education. So I'm gonna start there. And then really, how might we make excellence inclusive through life transformative education? And then end with some implications for making excellence inclusive, specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically here at UConn. So, uh, you know, uh, I was introduced to life transformative education in the campaign here at UConn coming into uh, through the in interview process. And at least in, in the white paper that's available, you get to see that it's about enhancing the well-being and work engagements of graduates uh, years after graduation. So creating an educational experience that has a positive uh, transformative impact for them. Uh, what I really liked about it, though, is that it focuses on providing emotional, appropriate emotional expo exposure and also making sure that the educational experience is relevant, right? And the and, uh, example that's included in the white paper is having graduates who leave here feeling like someone cared about them as a person, and they gave them the opportunity to apply what they were learning in real, tangible ways. So let's get to the protests. These are indeed challenging times, and we've been able to see this uh, here on campus and throughout. So once again, multicultural race, uh, co multiracial coalitions in major cities throughout the country have taken to the streets to express their anger, frustration regarding the senseless murders of Maud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Rashad Brooks, and the continued pervasive impact of systemic racism resulting in black and brown folks disproportionately suffering the negative impact of the coronavirus. The current activism comes fresh off the heels of recent protests on college campuses throughout the world where racially minoritized students as some of the world's finest institutions, including this one, have been speaking out in resistance to their daily encounters with microaggressions, macro invalidations, and other not so subtle acts of racial discrimination. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts to advance diversity, post-secondary institutions around the world have found themselves in the midst of campus protests. Students and their allies are demanding for racial equity in higher education. Arguably at the heart of increased activism on college campuses is the failure of post-secondary institutions to create more inclusive learning environments, both in and out of the classroom, where students can engage in learning that suggests their lives and their lived experiences really matter. The reality is that the manner in which post-secondary institutions have implemented their diversity initiatives have not resulted in substantial transformation of the day-to-day -day operations of the campus. And I believe instead focus more on how to assimilate students into the existing dominant campus culture. Thus, the majority of diversity initiatives being implemented to support racially minoritized students rarely impact the campus systems and structures because they are not linked to institutional policies and practices. Moreover, the implementation of diversity initiatives across college campuses tend not to include an intentional focus on anti-racism as a central component of their inclusion efforts. So I've been trying to preach that a little bit since, since I've arrived. If we were to take a look at the student demands that have been emerging from hundreds of protests throughout the world, we see that many of the students protesting across the country in recent times arrived at their campuses expecting inclusion expecting diversity and not expecting intellectual, social, and cultural neglect. I believe this dissonant produces a psychic disequilibrium that can be quite traumatic. And in this context, the focus on mental health resources is not about some desire to be coddled, but much more about the need for resources and support that allow students for the recentering and healing of their cultural selves and inner souls. 
The recent protests on our campuses challenges us to embrace an approach to pedagogical transformation, to educational transformation that is much more aggressive and intentional, where college educators strive to transform their spaces into more inclusive learning environments. As you look at the student demands across various institutions, there is a consistent call for faculty development that would enhance their ability to create transformative, inclusive learning environments where the lives of all students matter. Specifically, in regards to teaching and learning, students have been asking for, among other things, revisions to the curriculum where topics related to race, ethnic studies, and social justice are featured more, and two, diversity and inclusion training for educators where instructors and administrators and staff acquire the skills to educate in increasingly diverse learning environments. So I think these, these demands are relevant to uh, how we think about life, a life transformative education here at Utah. So my argument here will be that making excellence inclusive, we have to embrace a critical and inclusive pedagogy and then critical and inclusive approach to life transformative education. And for me, a uh, critical and inclusive approach describes a pedagogy, a methodology of possibility that enables the creation of transformative, equitable, and identity affirming learning environments where all students have the chance to achieve at the highest levels and where diversity is central to the learning process. So not something that's add on. So I wanna take you uh, through the aspects that I think of critical inclusive pedagogy that I think are relevant for life transformative education, <clears throat> for realizing a life transformative education. The first is, is intentional practices. Here, educators who are committed to promoting a life transformative education must begin by conceptualizing an intentional approach to how they want to design the learning environment. When we have a well thought out and theoretically informed approach to educational experience, it ensures that there is a philo philosophical grounding that guides the programmatic and pedagogical decisions we make. And what's important about this is we have pretty much in every dif discipline and in every approach literature that can inform how we think about constructing the educational learning environment. Voice and the lived experiences. I have come to understand that we can create life transformative educational experiences when we encourage students to personalize subject matter with examples from their own lived experiences and empower them to make connections between the ideas they are learning in the classroom and the world as they understand it. Activating student voices and leveraging their lived experiences are two ways in which educators can authentically engage learners while adding visibility to, the experience, to their experiences in the educational environment. Interdisciplinary and diverse content. Making excellence inclusive through life transformative education will require that we are thoughtful and critical in our consider consideration of what content and perspectives we include in our educational experiences. In order to create inclusive and equitable learning environments, educators will need to make sure that the content we choose to prioritize is A, balanced in its portrayal of diverse groups, and B, representative of diversity that exists within our classrooms, and C, where appropriate, inclusive of diverse perspectives and disciplines. Through life transformative education, our goal should be to construct learning environments that reinforce marginalized students, our most vulnerable students' sense of belonging. Anti-racist and equity-mindedness. In my ideal world, and yes, this is a world I try to live in sometimes, educators who seek to make inc excellence inclusive through LTE will utilize a variety of anti-racist and equity-minded programmatic and pedagogical practices designed to leverage their students' experiences as individuals and as a community of learners and encourage them to reflect and act. When we challenge our students to move from theory to praxis and vice versa, we are preparing them to engage in transformative work as they participate in what Bell Hooks calls education as the practice of freedom so that they can solve discrete problems while engaging in lifelong learning as a constant project of self and social transformation. 
identity affirming and socially just educational environments. Educators seeking to make excellence inclusive through LTE should be conscious of intersectionality as a method that can help us to deconstruct our own assumptions related to race, gender, class, and other forms of sexuality and other forms of diversity. The continued bias incidents at campuses, including our own, serve as a painful reminder that though we seek to create identity affirming spaces that are free of prejudice and discrimination, where microaggressions and micro invalidations have no home, we cannot. For some of our students, the learning environment will be a stinging reminder of how cruel the world is and can be. And for others, leaving our campus will provide an opportunity to return to life as normal and free. Courageous transparency. Those of us seeking to make excellence inclusive through LTE must develop the courage and fortitude to resist traditional notions of the role of the disconnected professor and be fully present in the learning environment. Though challenging, we must authentically bring our whole self into the learning environment and model for our students how to critically engage in the self-work of understanding the multiple aspects of our identities that inform how we show up in the learning environment. Resilient and emotional label of love. Making excellence inclusive through the realization of a life transformative education requires the, the construction of a learning environment where in the words of James Baldwin, everyone is embraced, where no, there is no oppression, where every life is valued. In this regard, creating the conditions for an inclusive learning environment must be an emotional labor of love where educators embrace all of their students as whole human beings consisting of mind, body, and soul and create caring, interactive, and dynamic classroom and campus environments that inspire deep and meaningful transformational learning and a powerful sense of belonging. So those are the core sort of facets of how I think about how a critical and inclusive pedagogy can inform our approach to life transformative education. And I will wrap up with some implications I think it has for making excellence inclusive at UConn. The first is that we have to examine life transformative educational objectives, course programs, activities, and outcomes from the perspective of making excellence inclusive, meaning that it has to drive our approach to how we construct uh, a life transformative education. We also need to pay attention to equitable pedagogical and pro programmatic practices and realize that they should be utilized to accommodate differences in the context of student learning, not to treat all students the same. Sometimes I think we are, our approach to education uh, sort of positions us to think about, we have to treat everyone the same. And approach like that doesn't account for the individual differences and talents that our students bring to the campus environment. We must constantly reflect on and examine the learning environment, the campus environment at multiple levels, in classrooms, departments, divisions, residence halls, student spaces, from the perspective of how we seek to make excellence inclusive. We must also facilitate dialogue with faculty and staff and departments and across disciplines for the best practices for creating a life transformative educational environment. And then finally, we must facilitate, oops, next one. We must build an infrastructure and provide opportunities for the development of competencies for making excellence inclusive through life transformative education. We need to figure out how to incentivize, recognize, and reward. And this last point here is important. We have to make sure that our campus faculty, staff, and administrators who are implementing a life transformative education or seek to uh, create life transformative experiences are re rewarded for that labor. Often this labor goes unrecognized, unrewarded, and may not always count in things like merit and promotion and other ways in which we validate the work, of, the good work of our community. And then last, we have to, continue to continuously seek out opportunities to build capacity for making excellence inclusive through LT that's specifically tailored for uh, our units and our departmental context. The other thing, in, in order to uh, avoid treating students the same, we also have to recognize that our units uh, are different with different uh, sort of specific 
uh, aspects in terms of how they're situated. And scaling up a life transformative education will have to take different forms and different approaches depending on the specific context of that unit program or department. And so then I'll close with this. Um, some of you who have heard me talk before will know that uh, Bell Hooks is a part of my key family, uh, intellectual family, and she talks about life transformative education uh, in a way that uh, associates it with the continued search for paradise. And she argues that the academy is not paradise, but perhaps, and this is my insertion here, by making excellence inclusive through LTE, the learning environment can be a place where paradise is created. UConn, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. And in that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality, even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries to transgress. For me and for Bell Hooks, this is the education as a practice of freedom. This is what I hope uh, our approach to life transformative education will be. What accepts me about the possibility of LTE is that by making excellence inclusive at UConn, even in these challenging times, we have the potential to unleash the emancipatory imagination of our students, generate a powerful sense of belonging, and send them out into the world prepared to accomplish the amazing things they were born to do. That is my hope, my vision for a life transformative education here at UConn. And I hope you see some similarities in your hopes and fear and your hopes and aspirations as well. I'll stop there and uh, hand it back over to, to Michael, I believe. Fantastic, Frank, appreciate that. Appreciate that. I am actually gonna hand it over to Jennifer Lee's Butts to get us into our next conversation. Yeah, so I think we wanna take a few minutes to um, have some questions and, and from the audience because those were incredibly powerful remarks. And I think hopefully, um, you know, I can tell you that there's, there's this sort of internal thread that's happening in my own head and I'm sure it's in everyone else's about um, these these snippets that we want to unpack very deeply. So, um, if folks want to unmute themselves, I think we can we can try. There are a lot of us in the room today, but I think we can try to to do that or post questions in the chat, and I can help monitor that um, for Frank as well. But if if anyone has a first question, now is your chance. Hi there, this is Martina Rosenberg from the Center for Excellence of Teaching and Learning. And um, I'm, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tuit, for your uh, presentation. I, I, that was very uh, inspiring. What resonated in particular with me were the aspects of um, course uh, design and objectives and programs and activities. What was for me um, not mentioned, but probably included in your thinking was the assessment, how we assess students and how we can make that also more inclusive. And I would I'd really be curious to hear your thoughts about that. Thank you for that question. Uh, yes, uh, we've been thinking a lot, uh, those of us who have uh, been at the forefront of advancing critical inclusive pedagogy about the ways in which we assess our, our success and progress there. And um, uh, if we had more time, I'd actually go through uh, an assessment framework that, that we've created. Uh, but I will just say that the assessment is a key part of this for, for all too long. We've been engaging in practices and not really having a sense of whether or not we're producing the desired outcomes. And, and far too often, uh, some of the approaches we're taking uh, can end up actually undermining our efforts, uh, particularly in the areas where we're actually trying to be more progressive. So uh, assessment is a key part of the puzzle and, and something that should be built into our program and course, divine, course designs um, uh, from, the, from the onset, for sure. So thank you for that question. Susanna Ujoa has a question, Susanna? Thank and then you. I saw John Elliott's hand. 
Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Dr. Tuid, uh, for your insightful presentation. Um, so I am a number one fan of all the ideas that you share with us this morning. But what should we say to parents, particularly parents that do not necessarily share our vision and the ideals that you share with us this morning? And they said, I want my uh, child, my son, daughter to go to Yukon take whatever classes they need and in and out, get a job. So coming from a very traditional mindset, coming from um, a place where they don't necessarily value um, some of the, um, the opportunities that absolutely are valuable, but perhaps will Possibly, I'm not saying it will, but it possibly extend the students uh, stayed at the university for one or two more semesters. Um, I stop there. I think you get the point. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, so um, a, a couple of responses and thank you for that question. Uh, one of the things that I think I find helpful as I think about this work is that we have specific outcomes that have uh, that are a part of our educational mission. But more importantly, those outcomes align with uh, we're now able to document how those uh, outcomes align with preferred choices, say, for example, of employers uh, and the types of skill sets that they're asking for uh, our graduates to have. They align with quality, overall quality of health and well being outcomes. Uh, they align with social uh, justice and civic uh, outcomes. So there's so many different ways in which we can rationalize and justify our approach to a life transformative education that connect back to the goals and intentions and aspirations they have for their students' education. Uh, and so I think we have to do a better job of, of connecting those dots so that they see the value in this and do a better job also of highlighting, highlighting the great things that students who uh, have the privilege of ex experiencing this type of pro uh, education go on to do in the world and the kind of impact that they have. So I think um, the more we can sort of position this as central to the success that they hope uh, for their for their for their loved ones, the more likely they are to embrace and trust our approach to education. Okay, John Elliott, you're up. So this is exciting, and I think that the folks on this call this morning are aligned in embracing what you thought, Frank, and embracing uh, life transformative education. What I worry about is the point you made, which was put incentives in place, and we have to be clear that we're recognizing, honoring, and rewarding the kinds of things that will cause our students to have these experiences. And it's not at all clear to me today that we've got that fully baked into our merit process, our reward process, our assessment and articulation of what we expect our faculty and staff to do. I think in this room, we're aligned about those expectations. We just haven't articulated them as well as we need to. And I think that's really one of our biggest challenges now. You've laid it out clear. What's not yet clear is how do we get there? Yeah, so the uh, important part of this conversation, which is not in, embedded uh, as explicitly in the presentation, is the uh, role that uh, or the efforts that are needed uh, related to interrogating uh, and reimagining our policies and practices that drive those systems you just named. Right. I, I do believe that we have within our midst the talents to figure out how we can center more uh firmly these aspirations into those structures right and it really uh boils down to how we're preparing folks to implement those various 
uh, structures. So we're beginning to have some conversations about how can we better uh, align our efforts uh, in, re in relationship to life transformative education with the structures and systems that are used to hire folks, to promote folks, to reward folks, and to uh, sustain and, and, and care for folks. I want to add that one as well. Uh, and, and, and I think I was uh, probably a little uh, understated in the emotional labor that this uh, requires, right? Uh, it's much, much easier to teach in a manner that treats all of our students as if they are the same. And much, much more difficult to customize education in ways that that uh, take the best of what our students bring to us and elevate it to the next level. So we have to be in a position where those things that are central to our business are better aligned with our goals and our aspirations. And I think we have to engage in, in critical conversations about those structures and systems and rebuild them so that they align in ways that support our goals. Terry, we'd love to hear your question now. Thank you. Um, my question is sort of similar, and I apologize for that. But first, I want to uh, thank you for a truly inspirational presentation. I was I'm very, very moved, and, and thank you so much for it. I, my question has to do also with the idea of treating all with treating all students as individuals rather than treating them the same. That seems so important, and yet there's such for so long been such a push about making everything uniform uh, and treating everybody the same. I find myself leading with my gut sometimes uh, and, and relying on my intuitions, which I know is problematic because so much of racism historically has been because people thought they were right, uh, trusting their intuitions. And I wonder if you have any guidance for us on this particular point. Yeah, I, I'm. Thank you for the question. I'm a huge proponent of trusting your gut, as I refer to it, uh, especially as my gut continues to grow on a daily basis. Uh, I have more more confidence in it. But uh, my point here is, your intuition, your instincts, your skills are all uh, something that has to be reinforced, strengthened, and practiced uh, on a regular basis. And I think where we get into trouble is where we don't do the hard self work to unpack those things that are sort of uh, subconscious to the ways in which we navigate the educational environment. And so this push to be more transparent, to show up more authentically, to show up in our full selves within the learning environment also requires an unpacking and understanding of, of who we are and how it informs the decisions we make on, a, on an instinctual level. Uh, so my response to that is yes, we can trust our, our gut, our instincts, but we have to do the hard work to really develop our sense of self and our awareness of how we show up in, in, in the educational environment. And when we have a better uh, sense of being able to do that, then we're more likely to engage and implement and, and navigate the learning environment in, 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 in constructive ways. Fantastic. So one quick technical um, request. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback. I think I'm, I'm seeing things. Folks are sending me messages. So as much as I hate to do this, can folks turn off their cameras unless they're speaking? And uh, make sure you're muted just to try to see if that helps us with bandwidth issues. I want to make sure that answers um, from the, the questioners and the, and the responses from, uh, from Dr. Tewitt are heard. Thank you so much. This goes against all of my instincts to not be able to see your faces. Um, all right, my friend Dylan Audet is up next. Well, thank you so much. Um, so apologies if this is maybe more directed towards inclusive pedagogy specifically than LTE. Um, I wanted to thank you so much for that presentation. It was really something that got me thinking about this. Uh, specifically, I always like to tell people what my lens is because I'm a little atypical here at the university and I'm sure Jennifer is laughing because I think I predicate half of the stuff I say in her honors meetings about this. But uh, I teach freshman and sophomore level bio and, and molecular cell bio classes at the Hartford Regional Campus. So that's always kind of where I'm, I'm thinking. Um, and uh, my class in my personal teaching philosophies built around these inclusive pedagogies that offer multiple chances for success and growth within classes. But one thing I 
want us to kind of think about and suggest that we bring back to our units is reconsidering the appropriate academic academic challenge for 1000s and early career classes. If your disciplines are like ours, um, we've sort of been ballooning the challenge and information that we require of students in their very first year here on campus. And we see that, especially on our regional campus, pushing a lot of students out of their major year one. So I'm absolutely a believer that um, that rigorous academics is a desirable endpoint for college, but I think sometimes we can fall into a trap of doing this too early and it just threatens students. And I think that uh, when you look at our unequal distribution of education across socioeconomic and racial divides in America, this is a barrier that disproportionately affects some of our, uh, our most vulnerable students. Uh, this is challenging. I know a lot of our programs are built, do not offer sufficient capacity to advance everybody through year one. But as an institution, it is something we might consider as a means of, you know, keeping more students in our programs long enough that they can grow and reach their potential. So thank you so much. And I uh, just wanted to start a conversation. Dylan, I appreciate that, that comment. And there are two things I'm, I'm sort of uh, latching on to in, in, in your remarks. So one, uh, specifically as it relates to inclusive pedagogy. Uh, any of my students who have taken a class with me would say uh, it is one of the most challenging classes they've ever taken. And so I reject this notion that we can't um, uh, create inclusive learning environments while still holding students to the highest levels of, of standards. Uh, this is about how we provide the support and, and, and the structure that allow them to be uh, successful. The second thing that that your your thoughts uh, uh, sort of directed me to was the outcomes. So you you identify uh, some specific outcomes that suggest uh, often it falls into two 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 sort of paradigms. One, uh, the students just weren't prepared to to cut it, right? Or two, uh, the one I prefer is there's something about the way we are approaching the education uh, process that is producing this result. And if the latter is true, then it would suggest that there's something we can do about it to change those results that, that doesn't necessarily default to we have to lower our standards, right? There are other ways, and we've been able to see this uh, uh, when students, when, when faculty and administrators and staff focus on how can we restructure, redesign our approach to this educational process, uh, we can not only uh, ensure greater inclusion, greater access, and greater success, but also elevate uh, the level of rigor and uh, production uh, that occurs in those spaces. Uh, it, it requires a shift in thinking about what the problem is and how do we solve it. Well, thank you very much. Fantastic. So we have a few questions that have appeared in the chat, but I'm going to ask uh, the people who've sent them to everyone to to just um, ask them to. Um, so Claire Kingu, my good friend Claire, uh, you are up. Hi, good morning. Uh, I have a question that has to do with the statements that many of our departments issued after the brutal police killings in the spring. Um, I think a large majority of, of departments wrote their own statements in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement, and uh, mine was, was one of them. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering really what you feel is the role of these statements in the space of the university. Um, and I, I, I do worry about them because I think that often we make the statement and then we don't, we don't follow up with, with action. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. And, and yes, I share your, your concern about symbolic statements or symbolic gestures. Uh, where we 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 put some words together and then we check the box right and 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 it's as if uh, the statement in itself will solve whatever concerns were related that required the statement being produced in the first place. Uh, so there, there's a growing uh, sort of body of, of of resources that speak to the importance of uh, designing actionable statements. Uh, this is something that the provost and I have had some some preliminary conversations about. But how do we use our statements as ways of 
of communicating our intent to do something about the problem we are trying to support, right? So that's one aspect of the statement. The other part of the statement, and I'm not gonna minimize this because I do think it's important, statements are one way in which we allow, allow our communities that are most impacted by what's happening to, to be seen, to be heard, and to be appreciated, all right? And so that, that's an important sort of function of those statements. Uh, and sometimes we fall into the trap of these general statements and we don't even name the communities that we're trying to, to support. So this is the, the uh, approach to uh, crafting statements that are so general, speaking to everyone. And I often remind folks, if you're creating statements that speak to everyone, it's, it's, it's likely that uh, that statement's not going to speak to me, right, in the, depending on the circumstance. So there, these statements have to be carefully constructed and, and done in a manner that, that satisfies uh, a few important considerations. Yes, that's helpful. Um, and maybe that means that we'll need to take a bit more time over them. I think we, we rushed, actually. I felt like we all rushed in the spring to, res to respond to what was happening and, and maybe didn't take that time that was necessary to speak to um, the specific communities concerned. Thank you. So next, um, my uh, co uh, co leader in this LTE effort, Tom. I think Tom had a question. Um, do you want to pose that, Tom? Tom Scheinfeld. Yeah, sorry, I, I muted as as instructed. Um, thanks, Frank. That was um, that was really that was really uh, uh, tremendous and, and very helpful. Um, one of the things I'm I'm interested in um, in, in this LTE effort is um, the kinds of institutional barriers that there are um, to to students um, who are looking to take advantage of some of these some of these experiences that that constitute LTE and in the past have been thought of as kind of optional or 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 extra kinds of learning opportunities like summer internships like um, like you know. Uh, uh, Working as a, as an assistant in a lab, as a research assistant, undergraduate research opportunities. These these things that were sort of always thought of as like enrichment activities, but in the end, but that we know and with a focus on life transformative education are central to 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 that that broader education, that life transforming education. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, what are the range of of institutional and other barriers that you see to um, minoritized students taking advantage of of those kinds of things like you know good summer internships good uh, research assistant experiences and other kinds of experiential learning opportunities great question uh, and and there are a host of barriers uh, uh, some we have uh, uh, more control over uh, some we don't have any control over so for example we have a significant, uh, I think it's a sig significant number of undocumented uh, students at UConn, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. And, and there are some policies and practices that uh, allow, uh, that prevents uh, students from uh, participating in, in many of the high impact practices that, that are available across the institution, right? So that's, that, that's one that, that, that's complicated, obviously. But I think when we're trying to uh, uh, have a better understanding of how we can address some of those barriers. Uh, for, for other students, um, some of the high impact practices require uh, resources, even though we may feel like there, there's support for it. Sometimes the, 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 the resources connected to participating, whether it's study abroad or, or, or internships, unpaid internships, versus needing to work to provide resources to family. So how do you rationalize those, those types of choices? Uh, so there, there are a range of barriers. I think on a broader institutional level, um, you know, we, we still, I, my concern is ensuring that we have the capacity uh, and, and capacity, I mean, knowledge, skills, and resources to deliver on our promises for a life transformative education. Uh, I think, you know, many of us probably think we do some aspects of it, which is uh, good that we're not starting from scratch. 
But I think to do it in a, in a comprehensive way is going to require that as an institution, we're able to accommodate uh, uh, across the system uh, the different types of students that are part of our community. We have the, the knowledge to be able to differentiate and, and make adjustments as, as needed. Uh, and then I, I think uh, the reality is in an ideal world, we would want our students to have access to, regardless of where they are in the system, where they've come from, to have access to high impact practices, to have access to engaged learning communities that are smaller, that support uh, their overall uh, well-being. And I think also to have access to uh, culturally affirming and affinity-based programming and resources. Um, and, and our population is growing so, so diverse uh, on a daily basis. I, want, I, I, I do wonder that are we, are we keeping pace with the kinds of adjustments we need to make uh, and not relying on traditional ways of doing uh, how we've uh, historically done things to fit the new types of students that are coming to our institution. So, um, yeah, plenty of barriers, but I, again, I think uh, one way for us to identify where those barriers are, are to really focus on what are the, the sort of gatekeeping or, or gate, gateway uh, uh, points of, of, um, of impact at our institution. Great, great. Thank you, Frank. This is totally booing my spirits this morning, this fantastic dialogue, all these wonderful questions. I'm going to try to get in as many more as I can. So Sherry, you're up next. Thanks, Jen. I want to um, thank Frank for mentioning Bell Hooks. I actually breathed a deep sigh of relief when I heard her name. Thank you very much. Um, because we student WGSS students love bell hooks and we start off every class talking about um, a liberatory education. So thank you for that. And I really appreciate the slides that you provided for us as well. I, and I would say that um, in Tom's inaugural address to the university, he mentioned a WGSS course as being an example of life transformative education. One of the things that I get concerned about, though, is how do we balance, and I'm not saying that anybody has an answer to this now, but how do we also balance the push for life transformative education with the pressure to provide large lectures with jet, for gen ed requirements in the cheapest way possible, um, or for APIRs who are teaching six to seven classes a year and are going to be most interested in teaching those LTE classes because they are the ones that need that for merit and promotion. So, I mean, just, I, I would love your feedback on that, but also just something to think about in terms of maybe some barriers, right? Institutional barriers. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer that to, uh, in a way by saying, I, I know that this is something that the provost office has been thinking about very intently. Uh, that we cannot uh, implement a life transformative education and not account for uh, the disproportionate impact it would have on some as some members of our community um, from a, a variety of dimensions. Uh, and so we need to we need to assess those those points of, of conflict and, and and figure out how to respond a, a, appropriately. Uh, the other thing I, I think is. Uh, you know, as we are, as we're beginning to look at at, at our sort of curriculum and co-curricular initiatives more broadly, I think we have to uh, be sure that we're not putting uh, all responsibility for life for a life transformative education into these small sort of uh, not small but these specific isolated areas. So to say, for example, that, and I know we're not saying this, but uh, by way as an example to say that Gen Ed is where we will uh, sort of anchor our, our approach to life formative, uh, life transformative education. Uh, while that might be an important place to start it, uh, we can't isolate it to just that particular uh, programmatic uh, approach that we have as a, as a, um, a teaching philosophy or an educational philosophy. So, uh, your point in terms of really thinking about the impact that implementing uh, the, the goals of the president uh, related to life transformative education is, is very important. 
Thank you. All right, Gyun, I think you have a question related to our regional campuses. Or Grace, I'm sorry. Anything? Grace, are you there? Still looks like it's connected, but. Okay. Okay, let's, uh, Tamika, you had a comment you wanted to make. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, so I have a question about, you know, one of the things that we continue to talk about when it comes to LTE is obviously life transformative um, experiences. And I go back to the white paper and some of the early reading where we talked about um, transformative experiences in terms of um, opportunities to engage in um, internships and, and other experiential learning. But there's also a really significant piece tied to um, mentorship and tied to relationship building and adults that, that students feel like they can have a relationship with um, and this spans all communities um, particularly for our minoritized students and you know I think one of the things that that we don't talk much about is that you know when we look at the diversity of our students you know somewhere between six and seven percent to maybe nine or ten percent of students uh, respectively make up the black and latinx population and so we have a significantly smaller number of minoritized students, specifically in the black, black and brown community, um, when we think about the overall student population at UConn. And they get um, disproportionate um, supports. And so I think that, you know, if we continue to have, as we continue to have conversations about LCE and how as a university, we um, value the experiences of all students, and recognize that in bringing them together, that's how students learn more. That's how students develop more interpersonally and professionally. You know, how do we continue then to have conversations about actually increasing our student, um, our student diversity? Uh, the same thing happens at the faculty level. I mean, if you look over the last 10, 15 years, our faculty representation of black and brown faculty has not changed um, with, with, with respect to um, percentages. And so, you know, I just, I just wonder if you thought about kind of you know, one, how do we continue to build um, interpersonal supports for students? Because that is a piece of it. Um, and also, we continuously talk about supporting minoritized students, but we need to also talk about increasing the representation of minoritized students in our university if we really want to be a community where we learn from one another and are, and are, enriched, and are enriched by different um, opportunities um, of students and faculty. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Dr. LaSalle, for that question. Um, so, yes, you know, um, in, 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 in thinking about coming to UConn, one of the things I was, I was uh, glad to see was that the, the diversity of, uh, particularly the racial diversity of students seemed to, uh, in the aggregate, seemed to be going up, uh, especially over the years. Uh, but I was, I was curious to see when we disaggregated those numbers, uh, what that looked like. And so I think it's essential that we continue uh, to disaggregate uh, and, and look at specific communities, not only in terms of their, their racial categories, but also where students are being um, uh, positioned in the institution. So for example, uh, the number of black students we have at the undergraduate or graduate level, are they disproportionately in some areas compared to others? And why is that, right? And some of the answers to why that might be has to do with pipeline questions. Absolutely. But uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't an imperative for us to do something to, to make sure that numbers are growing in those areas. The other thing is when we don't disaggregate, um, we, we actually can have a, a, a sort of adverse effect in, in, in and in, in supporting the students. So think about, for example, our native and, and indigenous students who are off, often invisible in our, in our students of color numbers when we, when we um, talk about there as a community. Uh, and so, um, you know, one of the things I talk about in my, in my scholarship around this is we have to be careful about essentializing uh, the, the experiences of, of minoritized communities because um, it, it has this way of, of, of treating 
all of our racially minoritized communities as one mono, monolithic group. And, and even within, again, say, for example, the number of uh, the small number of black students who are at UConn, those black students identify in so many different ways. Some are African, some are Caribbean, uh, some are fourth, fifth generation uh, domestic Americans. So all of those different ways in which we think about uh, the diversity on the overall population, that diversity also exists within our communities. And we can't we can't take monolithic approaches to supporting uh, even within those groups. All right, thank you so much. So we are officially out of time. I have stretched this to the extent possible because we've got um, the provost visioning um, exercise at ten, and I know we need to get people um, to that next event. So. Let me give you a little bit of what's happening next. First, um, huge thank you. If you don't have your camera on, that's all right. I know we can all feel the applause, um, not only to Dr. Tuit, but also to everyone who participated, asked questions. Um, I, again, I'm so inspired by this discussion, and I hope you are today too. Our plan is to have a reflective breakout session following this talk. Um, however, our plan is also to exercise self care for everyone here and not do that reflective breakout session until after Thanksgiving. So please expect to see an invitation uh, again from Amanda. We'll, we'll put you into some opportunities for uh, breakout smaller group discussion. If you have questions that weren't able to be asked today, make a note. We'll have time to unpack all of this great information in more depth later, so watch out for that invitation. This has also been recorded. If you want to watch it again and just to get yourself into this space again later or to have your daily dose of um, just optimism, frankly, and hope for all the all the things that we want to see achieved here at UConn, you'll be able to access that. So Amanda will send that link out uh, later. And, um, and we will also open this up to people who couldn't join us today because they'll be able to watch the session so if you have friends or colleagues that you think would like to participate in the next brainstorming and reflective breakout session, I do hope you'll extend that invitation to them. So we want to accommodate as many voices and people in this discussion as possible. So with that, I think I need to bid everyone good morning and, uh, and say adieu and wish everyone a happy, wonderful Friday, a, a restful and relaxing weekend. And thank you all so much for being supportive of one another, UConn, our students and LTE. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Thank day, you, everybody. Thanks again, Frank.